I'm in St. Moritz, Switzerland, training at 6,000 feet as I prepare for the Copenhagen Marathon. Today, I'm gonna to be giving you the secret scoop on my first few days here, what I've been up to training-wise, but also a behind-the-scenes level of detail from my own personal journal of what I've done since I left Manchester last Thursday and using the data from my Coros. Huge thanks to Coros for sponsoring today's video. Let's get into it. So we had the joys of starting our trip from Manchester Airport Terminal 3. Now, I'm usually not one to judge. This was my first experience of this establishment, but I'd not heard good things. And sadly, it turned out to be true. Thankfully, we got there two and a half hours before our flight and we needed all of that spare time. The bag check machines weren't working. Then we queued with everyone else to get them checked by two of the human beings that were there. Then our bags had to be inspected. Then security took ages. All of the joyous airport stresses. We managed to find ourselves somewhere to sit by some miracle and enjoyed a classic airport meal deal. I went for an egg sandwich, which you could say is a little bit risky given the circumstances, but I like to live life on the edge. I also found someone's boarding pass on our table. So Richard, if you're watching this, I hope you made it to Ibiza. Our flight got delayed, classic. So we topped up with some more snacks and made sure we had enough water to stay hydrated until we got to the other side. We drink a lot of water. <laughs> And then the calamities just kept coming. I managed to drape my sleeve in the overflowing bowl of the water fountain, which meant that I was wet for the next two hours, before then spilling water all over myself again on the flight approximately two hours later. Lovely. Now, I've had a few people ask me already, why am I here? Why St. Moritz? It's cold. Why are you here for a month? And what am I training for whilst I'm out here? So I'll break it down for you. We're headed to St. Moritz because it is at altitude. You get a benefit from staying at altitude, living there, training there, if you're here for longer than three weeks, because your body adapts to there being less oxygen. Now, simplifying a lot of science, what that means is that your body adjusts to there being less oxygen around you by producing more red blood cells so that they can carry more oxygen in the lower oxygen environment to your muscles. You're then here for three, four, five, six weeks. We're staying for a month. You come down to sea level and you've got all those lovely new red blood cells. So they transport oxygen to your muscles in a higher proportion or amount, I guess, once you're at sea level. So then there's a lasting benefit. Why St. Moritz? Well, it's in Switzerland, it's close-ish. We did go to Flagstaff in January. And yes, it's a little bit cold. There'll probably still be snow on the ground when we arrive, but it's hard to find somewhere that's at altitude, kind of in the mountains, where there's not gonna be snow at this time of year. It is the back end of the ski season though, so the snow will be melting, it'll slowly get warmer, and who knows, we might even get a tan by the last week. In terms of what I'm training for, my eyes are all on the Copenhagen Marathon, which is on the 14th of May. You might have seen my video about the 228 project. I'm aiming for a massive PB in Copenhagen. Training so far has been going really well, so I'm looking forward to getting stuck in to the last few weeks of hard graft out in St. Moritz. Then the taper starts, and before I know it, I'll be on that start line. So I'll be covering the training that I'm doing whilst I'm out here. Follow along to see how it all goes. Once we landed in Milan, we had the joys of waiting for what feels like a day for the car hire to get sorted. Then you've got to check for any dents so they don't screw you over with a bill afterwards. And then we had the fun task of having to Tetris four people's one month's worth of luggage into an average size car. And we actually smashed it and even managed to fit ourselves into the car as well, which is always handy. And we weren't even squished. It was about 8 p.m. by this point, thanks to the delay, so we were pretty hangry. Thankfully, we were in Italy, so we did the only logical thing and found ourselves some pizza. The restaurant we ordered from didn't have any sit-in space for us, so we ate our pizzas over a bridge, watching some rats run around the rocks beneath us. Wholly romantic and idyllic. But the pizza was genuinely delicious. Nothing beats proper Italian pizza when you're starving and tired. Post pizza, we headed up the mountain. It's about a three hour drive from Milan to St. Moritz and it's a real shame it was dark because it's supposed to be an absolutely stunning drive. You drive past Lake Como, there's lots of tunnels that you go through and I had everyone playing the hold your breath in the tunnel game, which is actually really difficult when some of the tunnels are over 3K long. Then we arrived in a snowy St. Moritz, found our very cute rooms, so Swiss, 
this, so organized and just very quaint. We had ourselves a few essentials laid out for us as well, which was a really nice touch. And the rooms we're staying in here are a little bit like studio apartments with some kitchen space, an ensuite, a little table for eating, and of course, the main sleeping space. I was absolutely cream crackered by this point. It was past midnight, so I got ready for bed sharpish and tucked myself up for the first sleep at altitude. Next morning, I started the first day of camp with whatever I could throw together for breakfast. And because we hadn't had the chance to go food shopping yet, this meant that my usual tea and porridge became a black coffee and half a flapjack. Oh my God. <coughs> Oh my god, it's so strong. I'm more of a latte girl if and when I occasionally drink coffee. Check the weather. Minus four. <laughs> Feels like minus 11. I was clearly horrified, but I should note because it's dry here compared to quite a humid climate back home, minus four doesn't feel nearly as cold as minus four would feel in the UK, which is nice, but it also makes it really hard to know how to dress when you check the weather. After my strange breakfast had gone down and I was kitted up, ready for the elements, we went out for our first run in literal Narnia. It had actually snowed a little bit overnight, so our footsteps were making that lovely snow squishing noise, but but most of the lake paths were uncovered. It was only sort of the bits in the shade that were still snowy. And throughout this run, I was really pleasantly surprised at where my heart rate was at. Typically at altitude, especially for the first five to seven days, everything tends to feel a lot harder because you've not started acclimating to the altitude yet. So your heart rate tends to be elevated and that can then be the case throughout your time at elevation sometimes. But my heart rate on this run stayed really similar to where it would be for just a normal easy run back home. Maybe we were running a little slower with it being post-travel and being cautious, but I felt really great and I couldn't even notice that there was less oxygen. So, fitness. That was until we ran up a massive hill. Then I noticed it. Get the heart rate back under the 150s. Not so easy on the hill. I'm keeping a close eye on the Coros to check my heart rate and keep it controlled on all my runs out here, but especially at the start, because you really don't want to overdo it in that first week when you're acclimating or it can leave you absolutely spent by week three, which is not what we want. A quick pee stop as is tradition on all of our easy runs. Where have you been? I was doing nothing. <laughs> And then we stopped to throw some rocks on the lake and just appreciate the general scenes. The views throughout this run were honestly breathtaking. We're surrounded by peaks where we are and the footage really doesn't even do it justice. I feel so lucky to be able to live and work here for a month doing what I love with my team. Post five mile easy run, it was time for some much needed second breakfast. So I took myself to Lidl to get the goods for the next few days and to just explore the different things that you can buy in the supermarket out here. I've always I've always been a little bit obsessed with supermarkets when I visit different countries. I just love seeing what's different and scouting out the treats that I'm gonna buy to take home with me at the end of the trip. And if you're watching this and have any recommendations of Swiss snacks or treats that I've just gotta get my hands on to take home with me, let me know in the comment section below. One thing I did notice was how expensive the food is out here. The exchange rate is about one Swiss franc to 90p of the British pound. So it's not quite like for like, but I still thought a lot of the prices were pretty steep. Then I saw some cat treats, which reminded me of my little babies back home and it made me sad because I don't get to see them for the whole month. After the food shop, it was brunch time, Eggos on toast and a lovely cup of Yorkshire tea. Can't beat it. Never forget to bring your British tea bags with you to the rest of Europe. You just can't get the same stuff. And then, and I'm still in total shock of this, I unpacked and tidied away all of my things neatly. I think Molly's tidy influence had momentarily spread to me. I'm usually the live out of a suitcase for two weeks until it annoys you kind of traveler, but at this point I'm proud. Then I retrieved and opened my shoe delivery. Shout out to New Balance for sending me some new 1080s, my favorite mileage shoe, and my racing shoes for Copenhagen. These were meant to arrive at home before I left, but got delayed due to the bank holidays. So they kindly sent some out to me whilst I'm here. And then I've written here, the clock struck five and it was time to do it all over again. <laughs> Things do get a little groundhog day on training camps sometimes. Time flies by and before you know it, you're running again. So headed out for another easy five miles. Again, 
beautiful heart rate, nice and controlled with an average of 138 and we averaged 742 minute miling or 448 per K. For dinner, I decided to make a nice rice bowl with salmon and some veggies. And this was probably the first time I've properly cooked for myself in maybe over a month because I'm absolutely spoiled rotten and Daniel is the chef of our house. So I actually had to message him basically asking how to cook rice. I am ashamed, cooked up a storm anyway, and it's actually harder to cook at altitude because if you're boiling something, it cooks at a lower temperature, so it'll take longer. And the low humidity can also dry foods out a lot quicker. So if there's any tips from my altitude chefs, stick them in the comment section below. I'd really appreciate it. Saturday morning, broke at approximately 7.30 a.m. After a pretty broken night's sleep, similar to the night before, I found it takes me two to three nights to be able to sleep through uninterrupted at altitude. I'm normally quite a heavy sleeper, but at altitude, I definitely wake up more, which is annoying, but I'm wearing my Coros whilst I sleep that tracks my sleep time to make sure that I'm still getting eight plus hours most nights. And the day started, of course, with porridge and tea, the right way. And I'm clearly still waking up whilst eating it as I stare into the abyss here. Got a little bit of coaching work done after breakfast, coaching other runners online and creating content is my full-time job these days. And it's what allows me to focus the rest of my time on training until hopefully one day running itself will also pay the bills. That would be pretty cool. Making a habit of making my bed out here, best way to open up your day before getting ready for the run and then just gently rolled out my feet before we headed off. Today's run was an easy 10 miles. Now these runs have become my bread and butter during marathon training. And it's amazing how with just an increase in volume, your attitude towards a previously long-ish run just changes. 10 miles goes by so quickly these days and I just find a nice little groove in my usual easy run pace, maybe 10 to 15 seconds per mile slower today, but crucially keeping that heart rate in a really nice place, which is probably a good time to talk about a really cool feature called effort pace that you get with the Coros Pace 2, which is the watch that I'm wearing for my runs these days. Effort pace looks at all of your personal historic biometric data, like paces and heart rate, and takes into account the actual terrain you're running on. So how difficult it is based on how hilly or how flat the ground that you're running on is. In a nutshell, what that tells you is, say I'm running up a 300 meter hill during a run and I check down at my watch and it says that I'm running at 8.45 minute miling. Effort pace will tell me how fast I'd be running for that equivalent effort or output on flat terrain. The cool thing about this feature is it's totally personal to you, based on your own historic data and efficiency as a runner on different terrains. The more that you use the watch, the more accurate it gets, and it'll take into account changes in fitness over time as well. Now this feature is actually gonna be pretty useful whilst I'm out here running. If I'm on a hillier route than today, I can look down at the effort pace Pace, as well as taking into account my heart rate and know what that pace would be if I were running on flat ground. And that's completely individual to me. And that essentially means I can make sure that I'm not hammering super hilly runs by trying to keep up with some arbitrary pace that I think I should be running whilst going uphill. Shout out to Koros once again for sponsoring this week's video. 7.33 average pace or 4.42 for you metric folk, a lovely easy 10 with Yip around the trail in Celerini, which is the next village down from us in St. Moritz. Very nice average heart rate of 132. That's even on the lower end of what I'd run at sea level for me and a pretty flat run, so I only hit 148 for the maximum, but I'm feeling really confident about where my heart rate is on these first few runs out here. A really good sign that I'm getting aerobically strong from all the hard training that I've been doing, which is what you wanna see when you've got a marathon around the corner. After a quick snack, we headed to the gym, which is right next to an ice rink, obviously. <laughs> Very tempted to go out there and have a skate whilst I'm out here, but I won't do that because I'm here to run, not to fall over and hurt myself, and my ego in the process. <laughs> I've dropped down to just one gym session per week from my usual two, just for this second half of the marathon training block so that I can dedicate more time to recovery and just acknowledging that I'm running a lot more than I was a couple of months ago and just keeping the gym work fairly light and simple. I'm focusing on key runners exercises today, trap bar deadlifts, box jumps, split squats, step ups, some core and some single leg work. And it's really handy that the gym is just a stone's throw from where we're staying out here and 
so is everything really. The pool's around the corner, you can walk down the road to go to the shops. Everything's just accessible and it feels like a little village, which compared to Flagstaff is a lot more convenient because if you need some milk, you can just pop out and get it rather than having to get in the car and drive somewhere. Chilled out for the rest of Saturday, wrote a few coaching plans, planned a few videos as well for the next few weeks so stay tuned for those and to round off the diaries of an athlete adjusting to altitude it was sunday the best day of the week it was long run day i bloody love long runs these days and my confidence has just been growing and growing to the point where 20 miles is no longer daunting to me at the weekend compare that to a couple of months ago where i'd probably be a little bit nervous for those big long runs because they're about seven miles longer than a normal long run throughout the rest of the year when I'm not in marathon training. So it's nice to just look forward to getting out and running for two, two and a half hours. A little bit shorter today, again, just to recognize that we're adjusting and we've just got here. So I had 18 miles on the plan. Didn't bring the camera out with me today because it was all business and bottles practice, but here's a little clip of what I would have looked like during the run as I'm just, clipping along, having a great time. I took four bottles with me to practice today, mainly practicing picking up the bottles from a table or a fence post in this scenario, because that's one of the things come race day that makes me quite nervous whether I'm gonna be able to pick up the bottles or not. I feel quite comfortable with my fueling strategy by this point, taking on the liquid, taking on the carbs doesn't phase me, but even the most experienced marathon runners will miss a bottle or drop a bottle on race day. So the more I practice, the more my confidence will grow in my bottle picking up ability. So took four bottles, took one at four miles, eight miles, 12 miles and 16 miles of the run, which is a little bit longer in terms of a gap between each drink than I'll have in the race itself, but I'm also not running anywhere near as fast today, so four was enough. And I also had some caffeine before the run. Now, before you shout at me and say, Philly, you said caffeine was out. And if you haven't seen this video where I literally projectile vomit during a long run, because of a caffeine gel, go and check that out afterwards. But hear me out, I've spoken to my nutritionist and my physiologist and they have recommended that I give caffeine one more chance and Look, caffeine is totally individual. Everyone's sensitivity to it is totally different. Some people were there recommending that you have 200, 250 milligrams, and for other people they need much less. And I'm on the lower end of the scale. I'm clearly quite sensitive in a bowels sense to caffeine. So 100 milligrams is what I had last time I ran and it didn't go well. Today, we sliced that in half to 50 milligrams and so far so good. There were no negative effects. I am gonna need to try that out at least two or three more times whilst I'm out here with the same positive result for me to feel confident to then use it on race day because I don't want any chance of me vomiting because of caffeine again during a marathon because it's just not fun. But if I can get it right, then I can get the performance benefit from having caffeine without the performance disbenefit disadvantage when you have too much. It's all trial and error, much like fueling for the marathon in general, so I'm trialing and erroring. I also picked up all of my drinks successfully, which is another confidence boost. Again, I'm gonna keep practicing that as the weeks progress, trying it with my left hand, trying it with my right hand, because the bottles will appear on different sides of the course during Copenhagen, so I've gotta make sure that both these hands are experienced at picking up the bottles. Ended up running 18 and a half miles in the end, and, uh, written in here, could have kept going for miles and miles. I'm not sure about miles and miles, but it's a really good feeling to feel like there's a lot more left in the tank after a long run like that. I just feel really fit at the moment and I feel really confident from just feeling good at altitude as well. I was expecting to feel a little bit flat or just a little bit tired in the first few days out here and that hasn't been the case. So long may that continue. Two hours and 11 minutes on the clock, averaging 7.05 minute miling or 4.24 minute Ks. I picked it up ever so slightly in that second half with permission from coach and my average heart rate was still really low. 144 for the average and 154 for the max happy days. That run rounded off a smaller week for me in this block, 72 miles or 100 and 
15 Ks. But I'd much rather finish the week slightly conservative, especially with it being my first few days out on camp, compared to just going flat out and feeling like I'm already on the back foot right at the start of the camp. In terms of what's next, I've got two more big weeks of training before I start the elusive taper. Hoping to stay in the high 80s to low 90s for both those weeks in terms of miles or between 140 to 150 Ks per week. And then we'll start gradually dropping down. I'm gonna document the taper experience, bring you with me for that. I'll probably slightly lose my mind in the process, but that's also part and parcel of this journey. In the meantime, I'm gonna keep these leggies rolling, working hard and putting in the last few miles for the 228 project. Love the grind.